Hi everyone, how's it going? Hey, you know, I got an email last week and the person told me that they just hated the intro music that I put in front of these videos. They didn't understand why I thought it was necessary to even do an intro in front of a Bigfoot video. And so, in honor of that email, I'm going to make this intro just about 15 seconds longer. And I hope you all enjoy it. All right, here we go. How'd you like that intro? Pretty good, wasn't it? You know, I do. I put that music in there because I like good music, and I'm able to find some really cool original stuff that's not played on the pop top 40 radio stations. And I, I like real good, unique music. And there is nothing better than an electric six-string guitar turned up way up loud, strumming out some blues or some jazz or some kind of cool riff and that's why i like that stuff i hope you do too okay let's get into the stories this first story is a it's not a bigfoot or a cryptid story it's about a ufo encounter and it's from christopher down in florida and he's remembering back when he was a little boy he writes i will try to relate this to the best of my memory and ask you all to realize that i was a young boy at the time but the event that i'm going to relate to you is burned into my memory here is some background. The event took place near Stark, Florida, which is located south of Jacksonville, up in the northern part of Florida. At the time, my mother and I lived in a nice trailer in a small trailer park that was located off of U.S. Highway 301 south of Stark, Florida. There were several residents in the park. I would hazard a guess of about 10 trailers at the time. The trailer park was built in the woods and we had dirt roads. Behind the trailer I lived in was a pond, not a big one, but big enough to have fish in it, along with water moccasins. I recall my mom shooting several when they had the termitity to invade our yard and present a clear and present danger to her number two son. Actually, it was us that had invaded their space, if the truth must be known. My friend across the street, let's call him Jim, that's not his real name, and I used to sit out and fish in the night during the summer when it was warm, among other things kids of those years would do. Things like making forts in the woods and climbing trees, etc. The night of the event was a typical North Florida night, hot and a clear sky. I do not remember what phase the moon was in, but I do recall it being a cloudless night. We had both gotten bored with fishing since we were not getting any bites, and so we were just lying on the grass looking up through the trees and stargazing. At the time, I was in the seventh grade, I believe. Jim was a year ahead of me. I remember looking around the starlit sky when I saw a solid bright light streaking across and down the night sky. I called it out to Jim and we both jumped up thinking it was probably a shooting star. We were both cured of that thought when the light, which was a solid color, and hang me if I can recall it, stopped its fall and then went into an orbit around the sky. It was circling the area around the pond and the trailer park. It was still pretty high up and neither Jim or I heard any sound. As we watched it circle, Jim grabbed my arm and said, look, and pointed up at the sky. Sure enough, he pointed out another solid bright light that was descending in what a fighter pilot would call an intercept course. Understand, please, that neither of the two lights were blinking, and we did not see anything other than the two solid bright lights. The first light continued its orbit, and the second light came up behind it. Again, they were both still up high, and all we could really see were two solid bright lights. There was no sound either, not the sound of a jet or propeller or driven engines. 
We both continued to watch the two lights, and the second one was closing up fast behind the first one. What happened next was the clincher, though. The second light came up behind the first light, and we both saw a white beam, like a searchlight beam, come from the second light and hit the first light, whereupon the first light winked out. I mean, it just vanished. No noise, no explosion, and again, not any sound of any Earth-style aircraft. After the first light winked out and vanished, the second light did several more orbits around the area, then accelerated up into the sky and was gone. Needless to say, Jim and I beat a hasty retreat to our respective homes. Now, the trailer park we lived in was pretty peaceful. It was surrounded by woods and palmetto patches, and Jim and I used to chase each other through the woods, playing war and generally roughhousing. After the incident, though, there were times when I would be outside in the yard, whether day or night, and I would get an uneasy feeling, and the hairs on my neck and arms would raise. Jim swore he saw a Bigfoot-like creature one evening. As for myself, I did not see anything, but I know I did not like staying at home after that. Something there surely made me feel uneasy. On my word, the events I have just related to you are true. I have added as much detail as I recall. Again, I ask for forbearance because it has been a very long time since this happened. I have not elaborated, but given you the facts as I recall them. Thank you for reading this narrative of something mysterious I witnessed long ago as a young boy, and that got me interested in UFOs and Bigfoot, or the skunk ape as he is known in Florida. Respectfully, Chris. Hey, Chris, thanks for that. Again, you know, I'm not going to just limit this channel to cryptids. If you've had an unusual experience with anything like a UFO, uh, man, send it in. I think these are extremely interesting. I really appreciate Chris sending this in. Thank you, Chris. This second story is sent to me by a 15-year-old young man. I I'd just like to say I appreciate the fact that he, he sent me his encounter and then about a month later, he sends me a revised copy and what a revised edition. And what he's done is he's condensed his story down and gotten to the point. And he's written it really well. He doesn't want me to give you his name, but when I read the story, he'll know who he is. And I just want to tell the young man I appreciate him doing that. Any 15-year-old that takes the time to revise and edit a story, that's a smart move. Because anything you write, can be improved every time, every time. So I appreciate that. But they have ongoing activity on some property that he works on. And this is pretty interesting because they want to keep after this and try to figure out what this is and get some more information. But let's get into his encounter. He writes, I live in southern middle Tennessee where there's not much to do but be outside in the woods. I'm 15 turning 16 this July and what happened in the summer of 2017 will be something that I will never forget. Me and my buddy went fishing at a pond on my neighbor's land. Since I work for my neighbor, he lets me use his land as long as I don't make deep ruts in his fields and tear up the roads. This pond was over the ridge behind my house down in a steep holler where you were lucky to get down there in any kind of vehicle. It was early August and summer was still in full effect. But we got down to the pond, something just didn't feel right. I didn't say anything to my friend because I know he'd laugh at me for saying something like that. After about an hour of fishing, we didn't get a single bite. It was hot that day, so we decided to ditch our poles and go swimming. It was about 3 p.m. when my buddy turned off the music and told me to get up on the dock. He said I heard something. Without a bit of hesitation, I did just that. We sat for about 30 seconds as still as we could be, and without hearing not even a bird singing, in my mind I thought, that's odd, where'd the nature go? About that time we heard a deep growl or scream, and it sounded mad. I grabbed my 22 revolver from my backpack and loaded it and waited, and my buddy said, why are you just standing there, shoot at it. Well, I gave him this look, and then I pointed the revolver down the holler, and I shot twice. Both shots hit a tree. I raised my gun a little higher and to the right and shot again, and this time it didn't hit a tree. After the third shot, we heard a scream again, but louder, and this thing sounded mad. We heard what sounded like a freight train coming straight for the pond. 
We grabbed our stuff and hit the hills, and we didn't see it. And I'm glad we didn't see it. And when we got back to my house, my bud asked me, what was that thing? I told him, you laugh at me if I told you what I think it was. He says, well, do I look like I'm in a state of mind to laugh? So we put our fishing poles down, and I told him that I thought it was a Bigfoot. He paused with a white face for what seemed like forever. I said, now what do you think I was talking about a couple of years ago? He didn't say anything. Anyway, after a couple of weeks, me and him went up on the ridge to a shooting house that overlooked a good plot. We sat and listened for hours on end. One day, we heard a small tree fall in the holler, so we hauled out of there to see what it was. When we got there, there was a green sapling snapped off in half like a toothpick at about our shoulders. We haven't been back there since. This year, he told me that we're going back this summer and we're going to find out whatever this is. I hope I get to send the results to you and get it up on this channel. Buddy, if you if you guys have any more encounters, uh, first let me say be careful because you're kind of making it sound like you shot this thing. I don't know if you did or not, but it, if you shot it, it's going to remember you, so you guys be careful. And uh, But if you have any more encounters, make sure and keep us updated. I really appreciate it. Thanks. This third story is an encounter in Alabama close to the Warrior River, and the writer wants to remain anonymous, which we honor that always. And he writes, We live in the backwoods of Alabama on about 100 acres on the Little Warrior River, and my family has lived there for close to 60 years. My dad's never liked me going in the woods by myself. When I was little, he always told me it was because of the snakes in the area, and he kept it that way until I was about 10 or so. Then he finally told me the truth. He said back in the 80s, when my other siblings were still little, they would always hear strange sounds in the woods, but they always brushed it off as bobcats screaming until one day one of my dad's friends was coming over to the house. He got here, and he was as white as a ghost, and he was crying. This is unusual for a 40-year-old grown man. My mom asked him what was wrong, and he couldn't even speak. He finally calmed down and told her what happened. He said a big hairy creature, about nine feet tall, stepped in front of his car and screamed at him and slapped his roof. This thing left a giant dent in the SUV's roof. After that, my parents started investigating, but they kept it a secret from my brothers and sisters so they wouldn't be frightened. Once they started looking for this thing, they found multiple footprints, which they took casts of, and found these little huts made out of bent-over trees with leaves in them for pillows. The strange thing is that my grandfather always talked of hearing a baby crying at night, but he was old and had dementia at the time, so my parents didn't believe him. After finding the huts in the woods, my dad started putting out corn, and one night he went to check the corn. Half of it was gone, and he shined his light on something huge and black, and they both took a step back from each other. My dad only had a forty-five pistol, and he said that if he shot it, the beast would have ripped him to shreds. I, you know... A 45 ACP is a pretty fat round. And when you're when you're afraid to shoot a 45 at something, it's it's something scary. But I digress. Let's get back to her story. He was truly terrified. He saw it a few more times in the woods. Then went to talk to our neighbor that owned the property near ours, but the man lived by himself and was a crazy old drunk. The reason my father came to him with this is because every time we went hunting on the old man's property, he would tell us to be careful of the werewolves. He said there was a dad and a mom and two little ones and that they liked to eat onions in his field, but they never seemed dangerous, so the man left them alone thinking they were a werewolf family. Sure enough, my dad investigated the field and there were tons of tracks that looked like huge human feet. Then one night, my brother and his friend were in our shed playing with some puppies, and they heard something on the tarp covering one of our boats, and they looked outside and saw a full-grown Bigfoot drinking water out of the tarp. 
They ran inside crying. After that, my parents told them what was going on. And after that, the sightings died down for a long time. That was 20 years ago, but about eight years ago, me and my brother were taking a trip down the river. It's a trip that we take a lot, and it's a two-day float. On the second day, we heard what sounded like a bulldozer tear through the woods, breaking trees as it moved. We never saw it, but we knew what it was, and it terrified us both. I was 10 years old at the time, and it's the only encounter I've had with it. Now keep in mind, the encounters in the beginning of this story aren't mine. They're my father's and my brother and my family's friends. The one at the end, however, is mine, and it's not as interesting as the others. He goes on to tell another encounter uh about one of his cousins that's jumping on a trampoline and they look over and see a huge monkey staring at them. Alabama apparently is a pretty active area for these encounters and sightings and this is probably not the, uh, an unusual story but I appreciate you sending it in. Let's move to the next story. All right. Okay this last encounter was sent to me by an individual who again would like to remain anonymous he writes, I'm a reserve police officer and a private security officer who contracts for state and the federal government, so I'd like to keep my name and exactly where I'm from as quiet as not everyone in my line of work is so open-minded. The thing about Northern Illinois that not a lot of people think about is there's a lot of Bigfoot activity. I never really believed it as I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman who spent more of my childhood outside rather than inside. Part of my security job includes doing patient transports between various hospitals and mental health facilities in the Midwest, and on one of these I saw something that made me a believer in all the stories I heard as a kid. We were on the road for a few hours when we finally got to the Illinois-Missouri border, the mighty Mississippi. That river marked that we were close to the town we were going to, about a hundred or so miles south of the Iowa border. We dropped off the patient without an issue, and I was glad as the amount of nicotine and caffeine in my system wasn't quite enough to fuel me through a physical confrontation. We stopped by a local diner and headed out on our way. When we got back to the bridge heading back into Illinois, I saw what I initially took as a farmer out in his field, which I thought was strange as it was 1 a.m., but I shrugged it off as a sick animal. Then he went into a pen and threw what looked like a sheep over his shoulder. We kept driving, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye the same figure running towards the river, which I thought was strange and made me focus more on him. It was then that I realized that this was too tall to be a man because the corn wasn't even up to his chest, and the sheep was absolutely puny over his shoulder. I initially thought that it was a lamb, but now it became clear it was a full-grown adult that had to be at least 200 pounds, if not more. When it got to the river, it walked in and started swimming, going straight across the current, not even seeming to touch it despite having one arm handicapped by its cargo. He got onto the Illinois side and crawled onto the bank with ease despite what might have been a six-foot incline and disappeared into the tree line. The surprise of seeing him scale that incline made me swallow some of the dip I had in my lip, and I was coughing when my partner woke up and asked what happened. I explained the situation to him, and he said I need to cut down on the overtime and that the lack of sleep was getting to my head. When we got back to the office, I talked to my sergeant, who has 20 years law enforcement experience, on top of four years active duty in the Marine Corps. He put a hand on my shoulder and he said that there are things out there that shouldn't be talked about and left it at that. The whole experience has left me looking over my shoulder every time I'm out hunting and has given me a newfound respect for the woods. Okay, imagine crossing a bridge, looking down into a field, and a huge creature is running across the field with some of your livestock over his shoulder and he bails off in a swift moving river 
and barely gets swept downstream because he's swimming so hard with one hand and he scales a six foot incline on the other bank and is gone. Would that make you a believer? Because you know what? People don't do that kind of stuff. Only Bigfoot do. Okay, that's going to wrap up this video. Thank you all so much for for tuning in and listening tonight. And hopefully I'll have another video up tomorrow. I'm going to try to make up some time and add some videos for the time I lost from working and being sick. Y'all y'all didn't know. I didn't miss any work. Hey, I don't, I don't miss work because I'm sick. We'll get some more videos up this weekend. Hey, I really appreciate you. And we'll see you on the next video. Thanks. Mm -hmm.